Welcome, I'm Giovanni Zonalda, the director of the Duke Center for International Global Studies and of the Rethinking Diplomacy Program. Uh, thank you uh, to all the attendees to uh, uh, join us for this uh, uh, very interesting and timely discussion. And uh, this is going. This is the first event of a new uh, multi-stakeholder framework series and we will explain what it is, organized by the Duke Center for International Global Studies, Rethinking Diplomacy Program. Uh, and uh, as we, I said, it's a timely discussion on the vit vital need for science and technology as a central component to reshape US diplomatic strategy. The virtual discussion will feature insights from Dusik's Rethinking Diplomacy and Harvard University fellow, Dr. Benjamin Schmidt, and will be moderated by me, and I will be joined by a Duke uh, alumna, uh, uh, Amrita ba Dr. Amrita ban Banjari, and uh, she is the vice chair of the National Science Policy Network, Science Diplomacy Committee, and uh, she's certainly uh, part of a very um, active and, uh, uh, I would say, I'm very impressed by your group of uh, postdocs uh, uh, who are working on science diplomacy and uh, also science policy. They are doing a fantastic job and we are very happy that we are collaborating on uh, several uh, ideas and hopefully projects in the future. And uh, I will ask Amrita, Dr. Bantry, and uh, to uh, let us know, to tell us a little bit about their group before uh, we, uh, uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Schmidt to uh, start the, the conversation. The format will be uh, slightly uh, different from other uh, webinars that we had. Uh, Dr. Schmidt will uh, uh, speak for 15, 20 minutes, and then uh, we will open the floor to, for, to questions. And uh, uh, Amrit and I will uh, ask the first couple of questions and then I will uh, take questions from the from the audience and uh, uh, ask them to uh, Dr. Schmidt or uh, Amrita. And uh, one, uh, just uh, please send all questions or comments or uh, any communication uh, to me through the Q&A function. So just please use the Q&A function and uh, you can ask questions or comments at any point in time. They, I will collect them and then I will ask them. Uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Schmidt at the end of the talk, uh, the end of his talk. Uh, let me just introduce the two speakers more uh, properly, uh, since uh, we have uh, the we are lucky to have both of them uh, on the same uh, stage. Uh, so, Dr. Ben Benjamin Smith is a postdoctoral research fellow and project development scientist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. At Harvard, Benjamin focuses on the development of instrumentation and infrastructure for the next for next generation Antarctic experimental cosmology facilities at the South Pole. There is also other things about the Antarctica, so uh, he will uh, uh, probably provide some example. So I would just say that from 2015 to 2019, uh, Benjamin served as European Energy Security Advisor at the US Department of State. So that is also part of his interest in diplomacy. Uh, Benjamin is also a fellow of uh, our uh, program, the Rethinking Diplomacy Program. And uh, so we are uh, often uh, in touch and we have been also publishing uh, some op-eds together. And, um, and uh, in addition to that, he's also a senior, senior fellow in the Democratic Resilience Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis Think Tank in Washington, D.C. And uh, he has been invited to, uh, to give lectures, uh, workshops all around the world. Uh, he has been publishing, uh, if I, I cannot keep up with how many articles and uh, op-eds and, uh, uh, and all kinds of uh, concept notes that uh, Benjamin is producing. I'm always amazed every morning when I wake up and say, oh, there is something new. And uh, he, he's really uh, a very prolific person. Uh, author. Um, Dr. Banjari, so Amrita, uh, is a vice, uh, as I said, is vice chair, vice chair of the National Science Policy Network, Science Diplomacy Committee, and she also leads the NSPN Science Diplomacy Exchange and Learning Program. She has been very active in this group since its, its inception and was a founding co-chair of the NSPN Southern Hub. 
She received her PhD in cell and developmental biology from Vanderbilt University and a bachelor degree in biology from Duke University. So welcome back to your alma mater. Amrita is passionate about understanding how policymakers, scientists, and civil society leverage science to address complex global challenges. So before we talk, if um, Amrita, would you like to say something about the NSPN? Uh, because this is also important for our students who are participating in this uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm uh, absolutely thrilled to be back even virtually um, at Duke uh, and just really grateful for this opportunity to participate in this conversation. Um, as Giovanni mentioned, I am involved in the National Science Policy Network. Um, we are a collection of science uh, early career researchers and engineers passionate about science policy, communication, outreach, and diplomacy. Um, we have many different training and communication opportunities for early career researchers who are also equally interested in these topics. And um, our involvement with this, uh, with this particular um, group has come out of, again, our interest in uh, diplomacy and the intersection of science and, and international relations. Uh, so we're really looking forward to this conversation, looking forward to future collaborations. And uh, thank you again so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Marita. Uh, ben? Please. Well, thank you so much, Giovanni, and thank you, Amarita. Um, it's really an honor to be here at Duke, even virtually, and, and a double honor to be on the same stage as the National Science Policy Network. Um, just fantastic work that they do, and we're really thrilled to be collaborating with them. And, and really, I have a lot of questions from this event uh, for, uh, for Amarita as well. So this is going to be a really good conversation. Um, and if we could start the slide deck. So, um, I wanted to talk today about something that has really been a core um, of, of what uh, I've been able to and had the honor of working with uh, the Duke Rethinking Diplomacy Program on for some time now, which is moving science from a quote, nice to have to a must have in US foreign policy. And, and this is incredibly important where we, uh, where we are today. So when we look at where we're standing right now, we're at the dawn of the Biden-Harris administration. We have fresh expectations and fresh uh, hopes for a new administration, another four years. And this has raised transatlantic confidence and global confidence that American leadership on the world stage can be restored. And that goes from addressing political, economic, and racial division here at home to leading the fight against creeping authoritarianism, kleptocracy, uh, economic issues, trade, and other transnational threats abroad so the challenges and the expectations, as I think we all know, are high right now. Fortunately, the Biden-Harris administration has prioritized an impl implementation of fact-based, science-oriented policy making, making is central to its global engagement. However, making good on this commitment is more pressing than ever, given all of the issues that we face today. And this goes on the, the broad spectrum from traditional science policy areas, uh, such as addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. This is why we're doing this event virtually and not in person. Uh, and climate change. And, and these are rightly main areas of focus when it comes to science policy and science diplomacy. But science and technology analysis really needs to go further uh, than these areas, given the growing number of cross-cutting threats we face in more what we'll talk about is traditional areas of US diplomacy or uh, maybe civil security, uh, 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 civil national security sort of uh, areas of focus. So for example, a key area uh, that the transatlantic community, I focus a lot on the US and, and Europe um, from my time in the State Department and, and after. So I'll, I'll focus on that, but it applies all the way around the globe because I know we have folks from uh, a, a number of countries calling in today. Um, but as an example, Washington, Brussels can really do a lot in this area of science and technology policy if they use this to jointly address uh, one of the trends that I look at when, when I'm up at SIPA. Uh, which is authoritarian regimes weaponizing critical infrastructure investments, economic deals, and emerging technologies to challenge Western liberal democratic institutions. Given the technical basis across each of these types of investment, I think, and I think we think, it's vital to develop a multidisciplinary policy response that includes pairing traditional economic and political analysis, such as uh, we often see both in the academic and the policy world, uh, when it comes to foreign policy, with the use of science and technology analysis to better understand the true nature of these threats and to develop countermeasures. It's also at the same time even more important uh, that the transatlantic community is, is rallied to have a coalition of officials, 
and experts of diverse background and disciplinary focus, including moving science and te technology to the center of our collective foreign policy and national security process. Um, and that's why we're, we're, when we're talking about this today, we're not just talking about uh, um, you know, the importance for science concepts, that's incredibly important, but also having practitioners of science and technology involved. So I wanna open this up, uh, uh, just go through these slides pretty quickly um, to talk about you know, pathways. I know we have a lot of students here today. So talk about pathways uh, for getting into science uh, diplomacy. Um, I'll give some examples from my own really non-traditional and unplanned career, uh, which I would not recommend uh, as a plan to anybody uh, once you see what I'm talking about. Um, and, then, uh, and then talk about the implications and on where we can apply these and what we're doing in the Rethinking Diplomacy program to apply these uh, sort of concepts uh, to real world um, you know, structural change uh, in, inside of uh, US uh, uh, federal government. Uh, so next slide. So uh, just stepping really quickly through, I'm from a science background. Uh, I started out in high school in a uh, Department of Energy program doing uh, X-ray diagnostics research in uh, fusion energy science. Um, and next slide. And I did that through um, throughout undergrad. Uh, I had the opportunity, and this is one of those non-traditional pathways uh, for scientists. Uh, I, I had... Um, uh, been suggested to apply for a U.S. Fulbright grant, which I, I got, and I did uh, this for a year in uh, in Germany at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics, which I should point out has never and does not do nuclear physics. Um, it's actually an atomic physics place that does uh, like fusion plasma science and things like this. And so um, that was really my first exposure to uh, studying abroad or, or working abroad, I guess in this case, because it was post uh, undergraduate. Um, and really having this exposure to foreign um, federal science research uh, programs, because really, you know, I was working at the Box Planck Society, which is very similar uh, in a lot of ways and has some differences to the way, um, you know, our national laboratory system in the United States works. So uh, next slide. Uh, so then I, I moved back to the United States, went to the University of Pennsylvania, where I did my PhD. Uh, and this focus uh, of my PhD was uh, what I'm still doing now, which is experimental cosmology or developing the instrumentation, detectors, technologies needed to look at the oldest light in the universe, the cosmic microwave background. Uh, this was done at high altitude in Northern Chile, and it involved a lot of interfacing with the Chilean government, both its, uh, its National Science Foundation equivalent, CONACYT, and also uh, ministries of infrastructure and things like this, because Chile, if you're not aware, is a global center for um, international astronomy collaboration. It's really a fantastic place to do uh, astronomy and astrophysics research in the Atacama Desert. It's high and dry. You can't ask for anything better aside from blasting off and, and putting a uh, telescope in space. Um, so next. Um, I'm now, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm skipping over the diplomacy part. Since 2019, I've been at Harvard where I'm working on developing uh, instrumentation still for uh, uh, cosmic microwave background research, um, next. Um, but this time uh, we're building this at the other place that's high and dry and great to do this sort of research, which is at, which is at the South Pole. So the US has a critical uh, role in leading uh, global science research at the South Pole itself in Antarctica. Um, at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. And this is where our program called the BICEP Array Project and a future project called CMB S4, um, which is uh, you know, a multinational, uh, multi-institution uh, project um, that, is, uh, that is going on at the South Pole itself. And, and we'll get back to the, some of these questions of, um, of international agreements that are required for this, the sort of science diplomacy that's needed for um, and you needed to be in the State Department and elsewhere in the U.S. Gov federal government to manage these sort of uh, resources and programs in such a remote location. So next slide. Um, in between, I ended up for four straight years, uh, starting in the Obama administration, uh, in the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Energy Resources, where I worked on the intersection of energy security and national security policy in the transatlantic space. Um, so this is uh, kind of just a taste of what the difference is. It's maybe somewhat jarring uh, in what the day-to-day -day looks like going from uh, the field and being dirty and building stuff in a lab and, and instrumentation development and in uh, doing high-level diplomacy and supporting our senior officials as they 
um, is they, they try to advance US national interest and, and the en uh, energy and national security of our partners and allies. Um, so on the, the bottom left is a, a meeting that I had the pleasure of having with um, with uh, uh, one of our, our, our assistant secretary in ENR with um, uh, Ukrainian President Poroshenko, and then of course, uh, a, a number of other bilateral engagements in Kyiv. So I did a lot of work in Ukraine uh, in, as, as a part of that. So next. Uh, next. Okay, so uh, as I said, early universe cosmology, that's kind of the sort of work I do. Um, uh, this is just showing the growth of structure in the universe from that CMB, that oldest light in the universe. Uh, but we're, um, uh, I just really want to just throw that up there to kind of show the scale of the sort of work we're doing next. And then also uh, from the Chile side, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, kind of moving through, if you just kind of click through rapidly, you can see the scale uh, of some of the instrumentation that we've developed. Um, uh, so you just kind of click next uh, a number of times to, yeah. So there's the telescope, and there's the receiver cabin, there's our camera that's taking all the great images of this, uh, our interior of the camera, the optics, and then uh, detectors, and um, next, uh, and next, and that's the ray package, and then, then the, uh, the actual antennas and detectors themselves. So we go all the way down, that's where we were uh, in Northern Chile, if you click next, you can see the, um, the direct uh, location and, and region that we were in. Next. And again, high, dry, extremely remote. Uh, so you'd think, okay, there's not a lot of diplomacy to be done there, but as I said, there's really a lot to do uh, in terms of interfacing with international collaboration. So by its very nature, science and science research is a global operation, whether you're doing theory, whether you're doing experimental work, we have, uh, we have uh, global collaborations of multi-institutions, um, and, and whether you're working on infrastructure development for that science, or if you're working on the instrumentation development or the theory or the data analysis, generally um, you have a global reach. This project that I did in grad school, just like my project I'm doing right now as a postdoc at Harvard, um, did have that global reach. We had our site in Chile. We had a uh, massive collaboration in North America and Canada, the United States and a number of other countries across Europe. Uh, and one of our, um, our supercomputers that held a lot of our data was actually in Durban, South Africa at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. So we really had, at least uh, at any given moment, four really invested continents working on just one project. And so that shows the sort of diplomacy that scientists informally uh, learn as, uh, as a, a product of, of doing their, uh, their research. Uh, next. Okay, next. That's just what it looks like on the site. Okay, so how did I get, how did I get into the State Department? And it comes back to this project that I did uh, as a subproject for um, uh, for my work in Chile uh, while I was at Penn. Um, basically, my graduate advisor looked at this camera, and you can kind of see in the bottom middle uh, there's a yellow top to this. So it's a big. Basically, this camera is a, a big meter and a half long and meter wide uh, cylinder uh, or can uh, that just really looked boring. It came out really bright yellow. We were kind of getting headaches in the lab. Um, and so we decided we wanted to do a program to both engage uh, the broader community um, and really just get something that we could uh, be more proud of in terms of uh, the outside of this, this, um, this, this cryostat or camera. Um, and so we engaged with a, um, a professor uh, named uh, Jackie Pileson in the uh, Penn Fine Arts Department who painted this magnificent uh, um, diptych painting, which you can see in the upper left. Um, which is uh, basically uh, meant to show the growth of structure in the universe uh, uh, as, as we're looking at the early universe, we're looking at you know, basically that CMB, cosmic microwave background and all the growth of structure down. Uh, so that was then photographed in an auto body company, wrapped it onto the camera, which you can see there and click next. Uh, so that's us with, uh, with the camera. And, um, and so we had this, we deployed it in 2013 and between 2013 and 2015, um, we found out basically that it had become one of the highest altitude art installations on earth uh, because it was riding on the back of one of the highest altitude telescopes on earth, not something we were planning, not something I was planning. Uh, and one day in 2015, uh, my graduate advisor said, you know, there was this original painting uh, how can we go, you know, it'd be great if we could buy it for the department. Can you go back to that art gallery and see if, you know, see how much they've charged? And so now I'm doing um, 
uh, you know, high-end art dealership, which I have absolutely zero um, idea of how to do. Um, and it, anyway, so this is just showing these sort of informal pathways. Um, the owner of the gallery uh, was the uh, honorary consul of Switzerland in Philadelphia and decided to uh, engage with another honorary consul, uh, which was uh, from Chile in Philadelphia. And we ultimately uh, built up this project called the Artacama Project, where we were able to display this uh, painting um, and uh, in the next. Um, and at the same time, we engaged with the diplomatic community. So this is uh, one of these uh, meetings that we had with, uh, with Chilean diplomats, uh, in particular, the uh, Chilean ambassador to the US. Um, in which we described our project and worked on how to uh, work between the United States and Chile on, as I said, increasing the infrastructure and support for really global and world-class science uh, going on uh, in South America, in Chile in particular. So next. So that's, uh, that's us meeting. And along the way, someone said, you know, there's all these, uh, you know, as you're thinking about doing postdocs in science, there's all these science uh, fellowship programs. And Amarita is going to talk uh, a bit about that, that she is one right now. Um, and uh, and so why don't you apply to these? I said, I have no idea what this is. Ended up applying and, and happened to get the IEEE Department of State Science and Technology Policy Fellowship, um, which uh, uh, basically sends one person a year into the State Department to specifically work in an area uh, that they that they find interesting. So I was planning on kind of going in for a year and, and that would be, a, be an interesting experience. Uh, and then getting on with uh, with my science career. So next. Uh, but what I found was a lot of the science and technology areas uh, that are key to energy security in Europe, when we were working this uh, from uh, the US Department of State side, it requires a diversification of source countries, delivery routes, fuel types, and all sorts of of understanding of the uh, the energy development chain and the uh, the technology chain uh, whether you're talking about hydrocarbons or renewables, nuclear, civil nuclear, or uh, as I started my career on, uh, kind of that next generation or future generation energy source uh, of, of thermonuclear fusion in the lab, um, you know, there's a lot of diplomacy going on and a lot of need at the same time for understanding how do you craft such diplomacy uh, to meet the needs of advancing U.S. Uh, foreign policy and national security priorities um, while managing diplomatic expectations kind of in traditional diplomacy. So next. Um, yeah, so um, I focused uh, heavily on, um, on uh, uh, countering Russian malign influence and, um, and malign energy activities in the European, uh, um, across the European continent. In particular, my area of responsibility really focused on um, basically Brussels through uh, the Russian Federation. So uh, Central and Eastern Europe and uh, NATO's Eastern flying countries, Ukraine, et cetera. One of the big issues that came up during that time and, and um, basically two weeks after I started my job, I was given the, port, the small, uh, uh, you know, quieter portfolio at that moment in time of the Nordic Baltic portfolio. There's a lot of uh, extremely important issues uh, to address bilaterally, but it was just, you know, territorially smaller and something that a, a new fresh diplomat could uh, in training could uh, try to uh, sink their teeth into. And uh, two weeks after I joined the State Department, uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was announced, which is a pipeline that would bring natural gas from the Russian Federation to Germany uh, and onward to the Baumgarten gas hub in Austria, um, uh, uh, should it be uh, ultimately completed. But because this was done after the illegal annexation of Crimea, um, and, and Russia's aggression in Eastern Ukraine. This was immediately concerning because Russia stated, uh, the Kremlin stated that um, it would be used to cut off gas transit through Ukraine and thereby undermine both the economic security of Ukraine and the strategic stability of Ukraine because Russia would then no longer have that physical infrastructure um, uh, reliance on that route. Um, so that was a big concern. It's since become, we're now in our sixth year of this issue being an issue and something that um, there's really a, a high, you know, high level need for something where you don't think that science and technology really are um, as germane to the issue because maybe it's a uh, more traditional um, economic policy or, or diplomatic uh, you know, foreign policy sort of discussion between the US and EU or US bilaterally with Germany or with Ukraine or something like that. 
Um, but as it turns out, when you look at all of these sort of policies, you really need to understand and have someone in the room um, who can, uh, and I'm not talking specifically about this in this case, uh, but in general, have, have science practitioners of science and technology in the room who can answer questions that may not be being asked in the room. Um, there are a lot of times where you have, uh, you know, a lot of people from uh, law, law backgrounds or uh, economics backgrounds or, um, or, or foreign policy, international relations, academic backgrounds and things like this. And that's all incredibly important. I don't want to undercut the importance of our, uh, our, our uh, career foreign service officers, for example, our, our civil service officers and, and all of our other public servants that do a tremendous job on this. Um, it's just that we need to have a more diverse representation in our view of disciplines that are getting excited about getting into the uh, diplomatic uh, arena, uh, so to speak. Because I've always said this, the best uh, policy, uh, uh, you know, uh, most effective policies that I've been involved with in various areas uh, across the European continent uh, when it comes to energy security have been when in the room we've had a foreign policy expert, someone has a background in history, someone has a background in economics, uh, and then having someone with a science and technology background as well, you can really start to come up with different policies and different strategies to engage at the level of, uh, for example, if we're talking about physical infrastructure, the level of where that physical infrastructure project is in its development. So, um, you know, is it time, you know, if it's in the pre-development phase, do you need to uh, move immediately to sanctions? Uh, if you really want something stopped, this is ultimately where we've gotten with Nord Stream 2. But over uh, several years, there was a lot of dialogue because that was you know, inappropriate, inappropriate diplomatic action that early in the process, um, because the hope uh, it was and is that a diplomatic solution can come up, uh, can be come up with for, for um, you know, blunting the impacts of this and stopping this project. Uh, that's, that's in particular on that. So next. I'll just throw this up here. Um, so after four years of focusing on this, I was finally uh, excited to get down to the South Pole and uh, with very limited internet access and things like this, take a breath, uh, see a couple of penguins along the way at McMurdo Station on the coast, and then um, and then you know just uh, be removed for a little bit from the day-to-day uh, -day foreign policy uh, and national security uh, uh, news churn. Um, and, and I was, uh, certainly, um, and, and it was uh, really a tremendous experience. I, I was there only for a short period of time in early 2020. Um, I've said that our teams down there were the, uh, uh, the trendsetters in terms of socially distancing, because we got back just a few weeks before COVID-19 kicked off. Um, and, you know, it's funny, because when I got back, uh, I found out uh, reading the news uh, that um, that same issue set, Russian energy issues, uh, actually was going on in the um, in the Antarctic region in, in south of the uh, Antarctic Treaty System boundary of, I believe, 60 degrees south latitude, uh, in which um, Roskiologia, the Russian state-owned um, geology agency, uh, was um, basically uh, uh, pushing, you know, basically um, increasing diplomatic tensions because it was, uh, it had reported that it had sent a ship down to do um, uh, seismic, uh, what is known as seismic shooting, or, or basically looking for um, oil and gas resources, hydrocarbon resources below the, uh, the Arctic seabed, which goes against one of the uh, specific articles of the Antarctic Treaty System that was passed back in the 50s, and then its, um, it's uh, resource development uh, uh, clauses that were passed in the 90s. So again, um, you know, it's, it's, you really can't escape science diplomacy no matter where you go. Uh, and certainly uh, the only other place that I can think more remote of that is in space. And our program has actually talked about this a few times of that need of space diplomacy as well. Um, so next. And that's, uh, that's where we get to today. Uh, the State Department needs more scientists. The National Security Council needs more scientists. Um, there is a long tradition in our view of science, uh, um, you know, science being a priority in the traditional national security space. Department of Defense has a tremendous uh, a focus on this Department of Energy does as well, but it doesn't really help you on diplomatic issues if you don't know where to go. If you don't have folks that are reminding people on the front lines of diplomacy or participating themselves, that actually there are you know tremendous national laboratory resources. There's tremendous uh, science potential and things like this, and so that's why we've been talking a lot about um, here at Duke in the Rethinking Diplomacy program. How can we not only 
increase the uh, interest in science diplomacy uh, for uh, addressing uh, international transatlantic, uh, sorry, transnational uh, um, issues and, and things like this in more traditional policy areas. Um, at the State Department, at the early ranks, so you know, talking about how to um, you know inspire the next generation, uh, how to engage with um, with with the fellows that are currently in uh, in doing science diplomacy, like uh, Amarita will talk about, and um, and also uh, how do we really get representation at higher levels uh, in the government? Because um, there's a long, long, long career supply chain of people that are are excellent and and um, gifted foreign policy and national security hands, um, but often they also don't know in the recruitment process who out there in the science community might be able to help answer some of these diplomatic questions as well. So, so there's a lot of structural um, barriers that, that we think we need to address and continue to strategize how to better address some of these pressing uh, 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 transnational issues uh, by getting practitioners of science and technology more uh, uh, equitably distributed throughout the government. Um, uh, in particular in, in the State Department, National Security Council, those sort of roles. Um, and whether it's creating additional roles or, um, or diversifying the roles that are there, um, there's a lot of different ways to get there. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, one of the things we've talked about is how to get a uh, science and technology track in the foreign career foreign service as well, um, have, have, um, have that be a, a, a potential because uh, to kind of wrap up this, this opener, uh, Going, uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, uh, trusting that your graduate thesis advisor is going to want to have you go uh, try to do a deal for a painting and a that happens to be owned by this and that. You know, go down this this rabbit hole uh, because you know one of the only ways that scientists and technologists are are currently entering government at lower levels is through this fellowship program, and that's really great. But it's it's still, uh, in, uh, at least in my view, insufficient and ad hoc for a number of reasons. Number one. Um, it doesn't always uh, allow for an easy transition to be a uh, permanent civil servant. Um, and number two, uh, because it's, uh, you know, kind of not necessarily, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of who, where the openings are at that given moment and um, in, in where you match up. And, and um, there's really a need, I think, for more focus on, on specific disciplines being brought in and added to that team, not to take away from anything that we've got, but added into that dialogue. So that we have the ability, um, you know, in this next era that we're in, in the Biden Harris administration, where we're looking at, uh, uh, we're hearing, a, a, you know, a lot of of uh, really great statements on the importance of science and technology, of of how do we actually operationalize that, and how do we address these issues um, that are are so important, and that's why it's not nice to have, not great, you know, we got lucky that we got a scientist in there. But it's a must-have, you know, if we're going to address these issues across the uh, multidisciplinary spectrum. So, with that, I uh, thank you all, and you can take the slide down, and we can just have a have a nice chat. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what uh, Amarita and Giovanni have to say as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a tour of the world in uh, not even. 80 days, but uh, in probably 20 minutes. So that was me. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that your uh, career and uh, your engagement with uh, this particular issue of science diplomacy is really uh, uh, inspiring, not only to uh, young uh, scholars or postdocs or graduate students, but it should be very relevant for all the debates that we have been having um, with the transition and now with, uh, with uh, President Biden in uh, the, the importance of science in policy, regardless whether it's the State Department or other departments. But since we are interested in uh, diplomacy, of course, we are focusing more on the State Department. But it's this idea of the relevance of participation of scientists in uh, 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 civilian security uh, and also with all the challenges that we are uh, talking right now about you know, health, because of the pandemic, uh, climate change, etc. If we don't have scientists in the room uh, to conduct some of the negotiations or being there just the beginning of the crafting of or drafting of the of the treaties, uh, it's impossible, frankly, to uh, to tackle some of these challenges, not only domestically but also especially internationally. 
uh, we will get back to that. And uh, Amrita, uh, please, um, I know that you have a lot of questions. So if you'd like to start with one and then we can also look at the chat, there are a lot, uh, the Q&A, there are a lot of interesting questions. Amrita, thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much, and um, I, you know, Ben, thank you so much for that great tour de force of of how to how to be involved as a scientist in diplomacy. Um, absolutely agree about the necessity of bringing, including that as a critical voice in all of these important discussions. I do have several questions, but um, one of the um, attendees really framed it really well. So I, I just wanna focus on that one. They, they're asking, was it difficult being heavily involved with energy research and diplomacy when you have a background in cosmology and physics? Is someone with a science background in general sufficient to provide the scientific context and insight into policies compared to an expert in energy? Um, so, you know, broad level, you know, kind of what are the challenges that a scientist without diplomatic training or policy training, what kind of challenges might they face to make sure that, you know, policy, the correct policy is, is crafted? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And one of, one of the things I will say is that um, I'm from an experimental physics background. So, uh, you know, what we focus on is how do we use basically developed uh, technologies um, that are, uh, you know, our, our next generation or things like this that can help answer fundamental physics questions, whether it's, um, you know, looking up at the, uh, at the early universe, like, um, like I'm focused on and have been focused on for about the past decade or so, or doing uh, fusion research or uh, high energy density physics research and things like that, like I did back in Rochester and uh, in, in Germany. Um, I, I, I guess th what I'm trying to say is that, you know, for in terms of energy, I found that the, um, the lessons learned for developing uh, these projects, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, nano, uh, nano scale detectors and uh, micron level uh, uh, readout wafers all the way up to, um, you know, the, the large scale six meter telescopes or, or a three story, you know, freestanding building uh, that's, that's going to support a brand new telescope structure that we're working on down at the South Pole right now. Um, these all have maybe on a smaller level, they're big for, uh, you know, in terms of, of science projects, uh, generally in the, um, uh, you know, 10 to 20 to $30 million range, depending on the size of the project. Um, but if you look in at the project development path for um, all of these sort of science installations um, and science uh, projects, they're very similar to the project development path um, that large scale energy um, infrastructure takes. Uh, and that's from upstream uh, uh, and midstream, you know, so uh, uh, drilling platforms and, uh, and pipelines uh, down to distribution centers, and, you know, gas, you know, all the way through the value chain of hydrocarbons to the entire value chain of the renewables industry, uh, whether it's a wind farm or solar uh, farm or things like this, to civil nuclear and to you know, future generation technologies like fusion, all of these sort of large scale projects have that same sort of project development path. So you have a, uh, you know, have um, to develop a risk register, you have to develop uh, project management tools, you have to develop um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, um, the critical design review, preliminary design review, all of these sort of stages then go into production of components and bring those together and then deploy those in the field and bring things into operation. Uh, the big difference between our projects and uh, energy projects and our energy projects are, uh, first of all, uh, for the most part uh, done on a commercial basis. Um, <laughs> so they, they have a much larger budget and they generally are much larger scale but they still have those same fundamental areas in that, that development chain. And so if you can apply, you could understand because it, it, it was absolutely not obvious to me um, sitting in the State Department when I was going to be asked a science question. And in fact, I was rarely asked a science question. I, and I'd love to ask, I'm gonna throw this back at Amrita and ask you if that's been your experience. I, I found that I needed to say that, tell basically both ask and answer a science question if I, if I found it, but you don't always have to make up, you're not trying to make up a science question. They're off, often there at the center of all these issues, especially in case Giovanni's an economic uh, diplomacy expert in these economic issues. They're, they're central to a lot of these areas. So um, yeah, I, I don't know, Amrita, has that been your experience as well? No, I think you've really hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, as a scientist, um, so as a quick background, I'm a AAAS congressional fellow. I work mostly on 
health policy and um, agricultural issues. So very a far cry from biomedical uh, research, which is my um, my training. And you're absolutely right. There isn't a, a not always a specific um, science question that were that were asked, but one can certainly find the parallels in their own background and their own training to say. Uh, to, to give an informed um, um, uh, opinion, um, just like you know you're saying with the with the differences in energy versus your your particular background, absolutely. But I'll say one thing. I'm going to have one but. There are specific areas, in, especially in when we're talking about the pandemic, that you really need a microbiologist or a virologist or someone in the room, a Dr. Fauci, who I know is either yeah. going to speak soon or has spoken at Duke yesterday. Uh, virtually this soon or? Yesterday. Oh, he spoke yesterday. Okay, great. I, I will have to go back and watch that video. But um, that's a great example of that, right? I can't go in and solve a pandemic necessarily. Mm -hmm. But if I was asked to do policy around it to maybe uh, work on supply chains or, exactly. or the distribution, that sort of thing, that might be something that I could help out with. Um, and so you really, it, it, it's, 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 you know, it flows uh, on that sort of thing. I think you're right. I think just, just very quickly, I think there's also the recognition of what are the limitations to your, you know, your expertise and, and making sure that you're not necessarily overshooting kind of what you can contribute in that space. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Although I do think I'm not a scientist, but I think that the uh, scientists are, uh, humble enough in recognizing when they don't know something and they will reach out to the experts who know uh, how to solve or to provide uh, the answer. So I think it's not just being uh, focusing on uh, your expertise as an astrophysicist. When you worked on energy, I'm sure you worked with uh, geologists and you work with uh, all kinds of uh, scientists, uh, especially applied scientists who uh, have been providing the, the, the answer to the questions and also able to collaborate with uh, foreign uh, and uh, foreign scientists uh, on the same project. So there is also sort of the universal language of science, the common epistemology that is very important. Uh, there is a question from Advaita Singh. Uh, this is uh, for you, Ben. Um, how do we move forward when a considerable and potentially increasing portion of the US population, such as climate change deniers, refuse to accept, accept existing science? I'm curious about how you believe we ought to include those individuals in a science-driven and increasingly globalized world. That is, I, I don't have an answer for that, because I think that's one of the biggest fundamental challenges that we have in this decade, we are going to have in this decade, because we have, as as uh, um, as, as you pointed out, uh, a real big divide uh, between um, you know uh, those that that reject science out of hand or reject expertise out of hand. And this has been growing for some time, um, and and those that want it involved in policy. I think one of the big things is to focus on the fact that. Um, science doesn't care about political parties, um, and that, for example, when uh, you know you're a science fellow, you're not a political appointee of a given party. Uh, you're there to serve a, a nonpartisan civil servant, and I think that's that's the sort of thing that um, has to be remembered. That politicization, you know, politicization of science is uh, is dangerous from that uh, that uh, uh, effect because you start to get a uh, contingent of folks that think that this is you know kind of like any other talking head sort of issue that someone has one opinion, someone has another. Now, that's not to say that science doesn't have disagreements, but they are um, hopefully based on empirical facts. And so that's the that's kind of the center of that. I'd love to hear what Amrita has to say on that, though, uh, because I don't have an answer. That's, that's a huge question. And, and I can't say that I have an answer either. I don't. The problem is, and I think a lot of the experts don't have the answer. I wanted to drill in a little bit, though, on the question. Um, because of my particular, you know, interests and, and position, um, there's a lot of questions of not necessarily anti-vaxxers, but vaccine hesitancy, I think, is such a big topic of discussion. Um, and some of the, you know, folks that I hear from, their, their suspicion or their concerns about the vaccine hesitancy are, are based in, a lot of the times, historical, sociological, um, social, uh, you know, challenges. And one of the tools um, is, of course, Ben's absolutely right. Um, having scientific expertise, having the data, the facts there, um, but then also recognizing that uh, sometimes you might need different messengers. So making sure that the right messengers 
are armed with that um, with that kind of knowledge. So again, it's a very small niche of the broader challenge, but um, sometimes understanding where people's hesitancy is coming from uh, can can hopefully bring them towards a place where they feel comfortable accepting what is fact and and the effect that that has on their behavior um, might be substantial. Thank you, Marita. I think this is a very important point because the more evidence we can provide on any topic, uh, the better it is, of course. Uh, but the, also, since we are interested in diplomacy, there is this uh, soft skills uh, that uh, diplomats are very good at and uh, that can be applied in uh, these situations in which uh, the diplomats are not just the diplomats of the State Department, but diplomats in life, they can uh, try to uh, to, to negotiate and navigate these uh, type of uh, issues. And of course, the, the other where uh, I think scientists can do a good job, especially scientists like you or Ben, who have been trained also in communicating results to a public who not necessarily know about you know, science. I mean, I, I don't know about vaccine. I mean, I just know what I read, right? And I believe the evidence in the sense that is presented, whether it's effective or not. But uh, I think that being able to communicate uh, the results in a very simple and yet um, you know, based evidence, uh, evidence-based um, way uh, is very important. And uh, uh, I just moved to another question from uh, Jayesh Gupta. And um, how can I help out with Federal Energy Initiative as an international student? Sorry, the Federal Federal Energy Initiative? Yes. Uh, I, I actually not sure what um, what you're referring to there. I think, I think uh, something related to energy or work in energy. Working in projects, energy policy. Uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of track two diplomacy possibilities um, uh, on that in terms of uh, organizations that work on global energy issues, whether it's climate change and uh, and that sort of thing, or or looking at emerging technologies. Um, I think those are are really fundamental to um, you know to opportunities that uh, uh, international students can have, and I think that it's also uh, really important um, you know that you know you as an international student that is here, you are a science diplomat or a diplomat, so to speak, uh, by definition, just by being uh, a student that's studying in, in a different country. So um, I think those sort of uh, opportunities are out there. Um, and, um, you know, there, as I said, there's, um, there's a lot of multinational organizations uh, as well that work on energy and climate issues um, uh, that, uh, you know, the UN, for example, or uh, the OSCE, etc., um, that um, that have opportunities for this as well. If, if you were talking about just non-specific U.S. federal government sort of things, um, I actually, uh, I, I, I can I ask a, can I ask another question? I think it's also from Jayesh. Um, is the lack of scientists an issue with countries around the world, or is it just the U.S.? As I recall, Chancellor Merkel has a PhD in quantum chemistry, and even the Pope, uh, there was a Pope with a clinical technician before he joined the church. Um, I, I, I just I love that question uh, because you know. Ch Chancellor Merkel is a great example here. Uh, you know, that's someone that has a PhD in quantum chemistry and uh, in quantum physics, and uh, you know, is leading one of the uh, uh, the foremost uh, you know power you know powers in the world. Uh, you know, we're we're, we're talking about um, the, about the German government, and you know, I have uh, rarely seen uh, around the world that being uh, something that that has taken place, and certainly not in this country. I, I mean, there's there are such a small handful of elected officials that are scientists, they are growing. And I know as NSPM, and I wanna ask Amrita, is, is working on that sort of thing as well, um, may, maybe both in the diplomatic, but also in the elected official thing. But um, when we're talking about science diplomacy and, and places for diplomats at, uh, you know, scientists in diplomacy and national security issues at, at higher levels, I mean, you know, I guess the ultimate high level is, is if a, a scientist was one day elected the president of the United States, um, and given the question we heard earlier, you know, that's really a question of, you know, are we in a political environment right now where that would even be possible? Um, and so th those are, are really, really big questions. Um, and so, sorry, I hijacked that question because I just loved it so much. Um, but I want to throw good. it back to Giovanni and Amrita to see sure. what you think about that. Uh, 
No, oh, I just wanted to um, also follow up with the first part of that question, which was the international students. I think that's a, a really um, important question and an important issue, uh, how to make sure that um, you know, the US being as diverse as it, as it is, how to make sure that those voices are included in, in these kind of conversations. I know that there are certain science policy fellowships that, uh, for instance, um, are open to non-US citizens, and I really do encourage you to find those. I know that the National Science Policy Network is really interested in that question, and I know that there are homegrown initiatives that we're trying to um, develop to make sure that those voices are included. Uh, as for the second part of the question on um, other countries, uh, you know, we're working with with some countries, uh, for instance, in Europe that have more, um, shall we call it developed, uh, you know, science diplomacy uh, programs, both academic. Um, and then there are, are partners that we have in, say, Latin America that are developing science policy fellowships, developing those kind of initiatives. So I think um, this is, I, I optimistically think that this is a growing field, um, a, you know, a place where people are recognizing the importance of including these uh, experts and these voices um, in these political and, and diplomatic challenges. So really that's what I'm seeing and hoping for. Thank you. And uh, also to students who are interested in uh, getting more information about these programs, they can get in touch with us and we will forward your emails to, to Amrita. And uh, so uh, this is a question from a, a, I would say, a real diplomat because he's really a diplomat, and is our diplomat in res our is the diplomat in residence for the Mid Atlantic region, uh, George Sibley, and uh, just to uh, introduce him also to our students, he's uh, is in uh, the area, and uh, whenever you want to ask questions about possible careers in the State Department, you can get in touch with him. Uh, again, you can get in touch with me and I will provide the uh, information. It's also on our website. And I want just to say also something, thank you to uh, uh, George Sibley, uh, that George was trained as a biologist. So like you, Amrita, and uh, so he certainly has a particular sensitivity to uh, this type of questions. So his uh, comment and question is, there is a lot of discussion about diplomats not being aware enough of the importance and need for scientists and science issues in their work. Is there enough awareness in the scientific community about the opportunities available for them to work in the diplomatic arena? Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to jump in on that question if that's okay. I think I also really liked that question. I was hoping we we're gonna get to it soon. Um, I think that especially now with the the situation with the pandemic with so much um unrest that is happening in this country with issues on vaccine hesitancy and vaccine nas nationalism i think i think that there is sort of a, a greater appreciation for the role of scientists in in public space i know that a lot of my peers um and perhaps i'm coming from a biased pool they are aware at least of the the necessity for being active in these um, political spaces and aware of the fellowships, the other opportunities to engage. But one of the reasons why NSPN was created is to make sure that that was the case, to make sure that they were aware of the various pipelines for scientists into science policy, into science diplomacy. Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that uh, there, there more needs to be done to make sure that even if, even if you don't want to devote your life to um, the State Department or your career to, to um, science policy, that, that there are opportunities to get involved in, in those kind of um, conversations and contribute. Yeah, absolutely, Amarita. And I, I just want to add uh, one thing on that front. And I, I think there's uh, also a need um, for, you know, for what I would call hidden scientists in diplomacy. There are scientists in diplomacy who you would not necessarily know have a science background. Um, and, and two examples that I, I've been able to interact with uh, when I was at the State Department and, and thankfully after as well um, is, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, Minister Mikhail Kortika of Poland, uh, or was a former Deputy Energy Minister, and he was the chairman of, uh, of uh, I don't know which COP were on the climate change uh, uh, conference, but two years ago, so whatever, that, whatever COP that was. Um, and um, so 
uh, so, so he has an engineering in, in physics background, as did the, the, the uh, immediately past uh, foreign minister of Ukraine, Pavel Klimkin, who had a physics background um, and, and came from a physics background. And so with those two individuals, I was able to sit and not only have a diplomatic conversation, uh, but also have, you know, sit down and look at maps and look at different projects uh, and, and, and talk about some of the technical areas. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't really until we started engaging, I was like, you know, wow, you, you really have a, you know, low, high level expertise. Oh, well, I had a, you know, an undergraduate degree or a master's degree or some, you know, PhD, something in, in a science field. And so I think I, you know, having scientists that are already in, in there, um, you know, telling their stories uh, is also incredibly important for, um, for, you know, structural reforms on, these are walking examples at mid to late careers uh, of, of, of having a scientist in that role and doing really high level deployment. I mean, Pablo Klimkin, uh, uh, for, for gosh sakes, was foreign minister uh, since the illegal annexation of Crimea and, and Russia's aggression in Eastern Ukraine. There's no higher stakes than that. And that's, that's a scientist uh, or some, someone with a science background, maybe not a PhD lab scientist, but someone that had a science degree that, um, uh, that, that is in that role as well. So I, I think that that's important to, um, to, to remember uh, in terms of uh, science representation in diplomacy. Thank you. I think that there are two questions that are connected, so I will put them together. Uh, they are from Hannah Long and Lindsay Gray. What is the most what is most important in communicating scientific knowledge perspectives to non-scientific people in a way that they understand and respect the science to incorporate it into policy? And the second question, which as, as I said, it's connected. Scientists are often faced with the challenge of translating complex scientific theories, principles, and ideas to non-scientific audiences when they transition into policy fields. I imagine that that issue is only compounded in diplomacy spaces where you are not only translating across disciplines, but also across multiple languages. As someone who has worked overseas, can you comment on what it is like to craft effective messages that translate across disciplinary and language fronts and what challenges that poses? I'm going to let uh, Ben really talk about the diplomatic side. I think the the first part of Lindsay's question, and, and just a quick shout out since Lindsay is a part of our NSPN group, um, is that there are certainly that the, the top line question, which is the challenge of translating com um, complex scientific theories to non-scientific audiences. Uh, what I have found, um, and as I speak to other far more expert professionals, is the know your audience message. Um, you know, know who you're talking to, know kind of the breadth of uh, what they need to know. And, you know, now is it's not the time to go into a dissertation level uh, conversation when they really need top line recommendations or, or, or guidance. Um, so that's kind of, which is not to say, toss out entirely the details or, um, you know, facts and figures, but again, just know your audience and know the limitations uh, some, at times of uh, what needs to be conveyed. But, uh, but I'm gonna let Ben talk about the, the diplomatic context as well. Yeah, absolutely. And on, on the diplomatic side, I would say, uh, that one of the biggest challenges that I think that scientists face are that policymakers um, often want a yes or no answer on things, and science does not always have that. It has a range of a spectrum of, of answers. So you often, uh, and not to say that you know it, that that means that science is somehow wrong. That just simply are different parameters. It's a complex space, um, and so you really need to um, break it down into you know looking at how. What, what you have to look at two things. You have to look at what is the operational goal of a specific foreign policy or national security uh, strategy on one hand, and is there a science question to be asked? And if so, what can I answer on it? And it's not to make up science or uh, or just apply science to something that doesn't need it. Uh, but if it is needed and it, it's relevant, then oftentimes um, that first column can be enhanced significantly uh, by having that kind of you know very focused uh, uh, set of options uh, within the science, um, uh, you know, the science, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, sort of response on that front. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a question that uh, Ben, you and I, um, Rita and our colleagues have 
discuss. And so I think it's a very important uh, one. Uh, this is from Chris Simmons, uh, a student. What are some changes policies you hope the Biden-Harris administration will push forward to better integrate and bring back science into American diplomacy? Well, that is the uh, the name of the game when it comes to this rethinking diplomacy program and science uh, science diplomacy. Um, you know, I, again, as I said at the start, I think that one of the biggest areas that needs to be addressed is that um, you know putting scientists in science roles are incredibly important, and unfortunately, uh, that bar was uh, was incredibly low during the past four years, where oftentimes there was not maybe not someone with uh, a science background and something that ought to have a science background. Um, so the Biden Harris administration uh, we've seen has already appointed tremendously talented scientists at the uh, offices of science and technology policy, for example. Um, but I think that those folks in OSTP would agree with me when I say this, that having allies in science scattered across the diplomatic uh, um, you know, I don't know what you would call enterprise value chain, something like that, uh, you know, uh, from, from top to bottom in the foreign service, top to bottom in the civil service, and, uh, and in other uh, key national security areas at the National Security Council is really important um, because you, you often find you have these, these silos that science can't even get in because there's no one in that, happens to be in that room that is asking a science question, or as Giovanni says, knows to go out and ask yeah, you know, we have an answer at, um, I don't know, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, for example, uh, or, or Oak Ridge National Laboratory, something like that. Um, or uh, folks in the academic community, someone at the Duke Physics Department, or, you know, something like that. So um, that, that's really important. I think that's still a structural change um, that, that needs to be addressed um, that, uh, you know, on, on one hand, these jobs don't necessarily exist at this point. Um, you know, there, there are directors for regional areas at the National Security Council, the directors for economic areas, the National Economic Council, and there are, are corresponding deputy assistant secretaries and things like this at uh, yeah, mid, to, mid to high level in the State Department. But there are very few that, um, you know, that would go to a scientist or something like that because, um, you know, the thinking is, is very, and, and you know, it's, it, it, and it should be in this case. Um, focused on international relations. And, and so I think that at the end of the day, we're going to, to overcome this. We need to actually in, you know, develop new strategies and new structures with potentially additional roles uh, to get folks in the room. And Amarita, I saw you nodding your head. So I, I just wanted to see what you had to say on that. I think you're, you, you know, again, um, I, I agree with you entirely. I, I think also what, what comes to mind as I listen to you, Ben, is of course, having the people in those in those rooms is absolutely critical. And I also think, uh, and perhaps this is a little self-serving, but also with early career researchers, um, you know, making sure that they have the tools and they have the exposure, you know, early in their career, to um, to be successful and to in those kind of and navigate those kind of diplomatic spaces. Um, you know, one of the things that we've heard is you know, that there's certainly this, this perception that scientists can't always navigate those challenges that they, you know, um, perhaps don't have those tools. And so making sure that they are exposed to those, kind, the, the craft, I guess, of diplomacy early in their careers might really set them up for success. And like you said, a neuro career researcher, they're, they're going to conferences, they're building relationships within the scientific community. Um, and so to be able to then go into these diplomatic roles and be able to amplify that kind of scientific expertise um, in, a, in a diplomatic space, I think can only be uh, to the benefit of these conversations. I would like to add something before another important question that is related to this issue, um, that I also think that there must be a way to, because it's a very competitive market. So scientists, you are a young scientist, you know that you know, there are a lot of opportunities in the private sector. Uh, and uh, uh, so you can decide that for different reasons, you prefer to work in the private sector or the public sector. So there must be incentives, whether they are uh, economic incentives or research opportunities that can be done only or Many, not only, but uh, could, could complement uh, basic research uh, that can be done because of these possibilities to do it in other countries uh, with uh, scientists from uh, other countries. So international projects in a way, but where 
uh, the diplomatic component is important in order to overcome a certain uh, uh, barriers that uh, will be there. And I think Ben, you provided some good examples of that. The other thing is that makes, I, I think that it's good and uh, it, it, it is a, I think very nice to see young scientists like you, Amrita, and your colleagues who are really passionate about this. And uh, you start early, and uh, uh, it seems to me that there is also a generational shift in terms of interest in combining your uh, scientific background with a, a more public, if you want, uh, mission. And uh, and I think also the, the important thing is to, and this is true for all, it's true also in other um, in other agencies. It's very important to have a sort of fluid, some fluid, fluidity, sorry, fluidity, uh, in which scientists can uh, go back and forth between uh, you know, research or in academia or private sector and and then the public um, or in a federal government. So I think that is an important thing. Uh, there is something that is important because. Uh, as we know that uh, we've, uh, when, whenever there is a change in administration nowadays, uh, there are these. Uh, ten, there is a tendency to change all the previous policies. So, in this case, the question is: Is there a way to establish infrastructure or tradition in governmental administration so that science-based recommendations and policy making can be maintained, maintained regardless of political po political fluctuations? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a big uh, uh, thing that we're working on here, which is looking at how can um, the, the the foreign service, which is a career long, uh, uh, ex, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, expectation in terms of uh, you know something that you can work uh, as a nonpartisan foreign service officer over uh, you know you know five you know th three four five different administrations in a row. Um, and that is part, you know, having that expertise, just like we have in the Foreign Service on foreign policy and economic issues, having scientists in there um, for the long haul as well, and seeing that as a career path, um, you know, is is really important. And, and I think that's that's one of the ways uh, that we get back to what I was saying that science really has to be nonpartisan when it comes to diplomacy, especially because a lot of a lot of foreign policy issues, I think you'll find to varying degrees are bipartisan. Um, and, and so too can science be kind of embedded in that um, to, to be running along in a career, um, you know, uh, I, I, and I, my, you know, dip, uh, diplomats, I, I'm trying to think of what the, like the, the ballast of the ship or whatever, steadying the ship uh, that the, the Foreign Service does, having scientists in that boat as well is really important. Uh, there is an interesting question from Benjamin Chen. How do you communicate the relative importance of certain scientific issues compared to other political issues? For example, scientists might, might think that climate change is more important than economic issue like the minimum wage, but how can that be communicated to an administration and prioritized against more immediately pressing concerns? And this is very true for climate change. As we know, it's a long-term uh, project. That is where I think uh, there is some room for influence uh, this process. But ben, if you want. Oh, I actually, uh, Amarita, uh, you're, 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 you're congressional. So that, that's, uh, those are some domestic issues that I think are important to address as well. No, I, I yeah, I, I, as we're sort of having this conversation, I keep thinking back to congressional action. Um, and I think, you know, to talk about brass tacks, I, I think it's this idea that climate change and economic issues are are divorced. I think that part is is hopefully shifting, and it's being brought, it's being better understood and be better appreciated that climate change is an economic issue. It right. it you know we're it is a humanitarian issue. It's 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 not something esoteric, and it's not something that's going to happen in the future. It is in fact happening now, and it's going to affect people's livelihoods. And so I, I definitely agree with this, the question of the minimum wage, but um, again, just thinking about climate change and all the economic impacts that, is, that it has, if we can ha our, get our policymakers, our civil society, our, our you know, um, citizenry to appreciate that, I think we stand a better chance of making that argument that this in fact has um, you know, an impact on how much, you buy, how much money you're gonna pay for a gallon of milk. If climate change is affecting agricultural and livestock output, then it's gonna, 
it's going to impact how much a household can, um, you know, how much it takes to put food on the table. So um, th that's kind of one of those the the conversations that that I'm hearing and and are being put forward. Um, yeah, I, I would like to add to this. It's if you think that now Wall Street is uh, looking at ESGs, right, Environmental Sustainable Goals, and they are really uh, even mutual funds or uh, investors or those who are uh, in the position to say yes or no to certain uh, choices uh, in terms of investments. Now they have a voice and the, even the Federal Reserve is uh, considering, and this is also true for other central banks, uh, uh, what to do in terms of climate change, how monetary policy that uh, can uh, have a say in that. And there are you know, discussion about, uh, uh, for instance, um, mortgages uh, because uh, because of climate change, you know, uh, there are changes also, the risk uh, assessment of uh, certain uh, uh, locations in terms of uh, hurricanes or not hurricanes. Um, and uh, so I think that it is a movement that is changing. And as I said, if already Wall Street and the Federal Reserve uh, are you know, thinking about what to do, uh, it's a good sign. I just wanted to say one last comment. Um, you know, I agree with you entirely, Giovanni. And I also think about um, the the case of auto manufacturers. You know, and the conversation that's had uh, that's had around emissions um, uh, requirements. You know, there's such an investment that goes into auto manufacturers having to meet emission requirements um, that, that that financial. Uh, you know, they're le they're less resistant to say go back to looser restrictions if um, if that means that their financial investment is going to go to waste. So again, this combination of making it good for business, for business to follow and understand and appreciate the, the impacts of, of climate change. And this is also a, a big opening for diplomats because when they really, uh, this, in this case, real, real diplomats who are uh, conducting negotiations now, uh, they know that uh, private sectors in several countries are uh, supporting this. And this is, of course, it's a big uh, constituency in both the US and other countries. Um, there is a question about how should science help to address of China's building islands in the South China Sea? Yeah, I, I think like that speaks to a broader um, point that I was trying to make earlier, which um, is I really see in a lot of these global issue sets, we're, we're increasingly looking at, uh, um, in terms of foreign policy challenges, a lot of the central issues are um, economic and, and, and um, you know, territorial integrity issues and things like this that, um, that do rely on science and technology to be understood. So the South China Sea uh, island building question as well has a lot to do with uh, international agreements, understanding, um, you know, what the maritime uh, uh, impacts are international maritime organizations, regulations, um, uh, the uh, UNCLOS, the UN um, Convention on the Law of the Sea, those all have real uh, science and technology and, and real uh, practical, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, answers of whether things are in, in line or not in line with international law. Um, and, and when you look at a lot of the headlines, what are we talking about? And I just spread this in Politico uh, at lunchtime. Um, you know, the, the uh, Biden administration has just put on hold the, um, uh, the TikTok ban from uh, the, the Trump administration uh, until a, uh, you know, a, a full review of that in terms of what the potential national security knock-on effects could be uh, is completed. And I think that that really speaks to this issue. You really need to have, so, um, you know, we have a lot of these emerging technology issues, whether it's, you know, when I, I talk about Europe, I'm talking about uh, these energy issues a lot, but we're also talking about, uh, um, you know, when you bring up China, China's uh, 17 plus one initiative across NATO's Eastern flank, uh, which is a part of its Belt and Road strategy. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's um, economic investments in uh, uh, emerging markets in Africa and South America and debt, debt trap diplomacy, this uh, idea of investing uh, in, um, you know, in, in critical infrastructure kind of with predatory loans so that a host nation or a, a, a government can't actually pay that back and then, uh, you know, uh, the, um, 
Uh, Beijing would then have some sort of territorial right over that or, or ownership of that, uh, that infrastructure, critical infrastructure. So you really need to have science and technology understanding which of these issues are, as I sometimes say, not just a commercial deal, quote unquote, um, and which actually are really just in the economic space and won't really have a major national security impact. Uh, because a lot of a lot of these sort of investments, whether they're infrastructure, whether they're emerging technologies, and whether they're uh, uh, economic deals, um, can have political elements to them. And some are are used for malign purposes, and some are actually just economic deals. Uh, and so you really need science and technology to be central in that uh, um, in both the State Department and National Security Council to better understand uh, and make these guidelines on where do we uh, focus our diplomatic energy when it comes to these sort of uh, these sort of issues. I have a, a, a follow-up questions about that because the, one of the issues when we talk about diplomacy is that diplomacy uh, diplomats have to focus on security uh, issues and challenges uh, and traditional security challenges and uh, how we make sure that the um, non-traditional security challenges related to armed conflicts or territorial disputes uh, are not taking the entire budget or, um, and this is true not only for the US State Department, but also for other uh, foreign uh, offices. Uh, what can be done uh, in addition to have more scientists in the room, but uh, from this is more from uh, budget allocations, I suppose, or having different um, agencies or, I'll, I'll just field that really quick first and then hear what Amrita has to say. But my, uh, I, think, I think Giovanni, um, you know, budgetary concerns are part of the structural issue that we were talking about earlier, um, which is to, in order to get more scientists and technologists in the room, there needs to be budget line items from Capitol Hill uh, because uh, these, these jobs are just few and far between to begin with. And if the first thing we need to do is increase our human capital in terms of intellectual expertise in specific fields, in this case, science and technology, but other, other areas can be focused on as well. Um, uh, because you're right, at DOD, there's, I mean, there's a lot of uh, research going on. DOE runs, uh, you know, uh, a number of national laboratories around the country. Uh, but, you know, I find oftentimes, uh, you know, policies that, you know, are driven from the national labs are, uh, are more successful or, or recommendations, I should say, not policies, but recommendations from national labs are more successful when they have a champion in government and having a scientist to turn to in that is really important uh, as well in order to advance those policies on a science and technology of fact-based, uh, evidence-based basis. Yeah, and I'll just say very quickly, of course, I don't have Ben's um, familiarity with the, with the State Department, but I think there's also the, um, you know, with, with scientists in these kind of roles, I would imagine that there's more potential for being forward thinking in, in these uh, s related policy rather than just reactive, just, you know, looking at, um, like you mentioned, the, the, tra the traditional uh, security related challenges. So um, again, with more inclusion, there's also more familiarity with what's going on right now, the cutting edge technology, and hopefully being able to um, anticipate those challenges rather than just waiting for the for the crisis. Absolutely. There is another question from uh, George Sibley. The National Academies advertise that they, quote, martial knowledge and expertise across disciplines to provide independent evidence-based guidance on many critical challenges, close. Are they doing enough in this regard? And if not, what do we need? I think they, I mean, I think they do, uh, play an absolutely critical role. The National Academies set, uh, for example, in my field, Decade, they do decadal surveys of various fields and they set up um, uh, they, they set up goals that allow the entire government to get to a place where it's it's funding yeah, this is just purely in a research setting but uh, it's it's funding uh, you know science grand challenges that our nation uh, is is looking to do each uh, you know chunk of years and that's needed because of a, uh, a political turnover. Um, you know, changes of administration, changes of uh, in Congress and things like this, and um, and and also uh, uh, because we need to then have those those uh, national academies reports be more reflected in the State Department, but more reflected in our diplomacy uh, in order to get to some of those goals. So they're doing a tremendous amount. I think that they need to be uh, even more well connected 
the National Academy of Sciences uh, headquarters building is literally adjacent to Harry S. Truman building, the State Department headquarters. Right. It's uh, about one car lane wide uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of a road to cross to get there. Uh, and of course, then they have the Albert Einstein statue in front of that, which is also in front of the State Department. So I think just in terms of an optical setting, the U.S. State Department uh, has at its front door science. It has Albert Einstein greeting you, even though that is the National Academy of Sciences uh, uh, side of the side of the street. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, we are getting close to the end. I want just to ask. Uh, this is really. <laughs> I would say maybe a stupid question, but since you mentioned space diplomacy, could you please tell me what space, diplo space diplomacy is? Thank you. Uh, I don't know. Amarie, do you want to start? or I'm going to let you feel that and okay. uh, just go for it. Well, look, I mean, the, the international agreements that, that we have, um, you know, Ex, you know, there are a lot of uh, a lot of. I, 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 I'm not an expert in space diplomacy, so I'll start that. I don't have a, a a working list in my brain of the names of the various treaties, but um, but they exist very much in the same way that um, uh, that the uh, you know UN uh, Treaty on the Law of the Sea and um, uh, the Antarctic Treaty System operate. There's I know a treaty system for the Moon in terms of. Uh, uh, you know, not having territorial uh, rights or to, you know claims of sovereignty in parts of the moon, um, but you know we are increasingly in an era of uh, of of um, you know moving in this decade towards more regular. I think we're maybe we're already in that uh, that regularity of commercial space flight, and so uh, as more nations have access to both low Earth orbit, um, you know, which uh, is incredibly uh, you know, important for everything that's going on on the ground in terms of commercial satellites and telecommunications and things like this, and, and establishing best practices for things like space junk when uh, satellites break up. You know, we could be in a, a situation where um, you know, we have so much debris, uh, a kind of a debris field building exponentially uh, in low Earth orbit that's going to make it more and more of a risky business to actually get off the planet, which is a really uh, frightening thing to think about. Uh, so cleaning up space junk is important and having best practices on, on that. Uh, for my field, there are just two more small points. On, in my field, uh, the increasing prevalence of uh, small satellites uh, for internet access is a big issue. Um, the Starlink satellite, uh, um, uh, you know, constellation, you know, hundreds of small satellites that um, that are being launched um, to bring, um, uh, you know, ready access, uh, global access from uh, uh, of the internet from from these satellite fields. Um, it's really important for affecting, uh, you know, in, uh, affecting real change in terms of connectivity here on the ground in remote areas or areas that are underserved uh, uh, by high speed internet. At the same time, for someone uh, who is in a field that, uh, that relies on looking at clear skies and, and has, uh, um, you know, has data sets that could be streaked out by, you know, just basically you see these uh, satellites going through your field of vision. It's a big issue. And I, I know that there was, uh, there's been a number of talks recently on that. And then finally, that's low Earth orbit, deep space. Okay. We have the United Arab Emirates, uh, the, People's Republic of, uh, the People's Republic of China, and the United States all uh, arriving in Martian orbit as we speak. Okay, so over the next several months, we're going to see three different continents represented uh, in the orbit of another planet, all arriving at the same time for the first time in history. Two of which, at least, the U.S. and China have uh, have have landers uh, that are going to be on the Martian surface. So establishing rules of the road, uh, uh, both in low Earth orbit and and in this case off planet, are really important as well. So. Giovanni, that's uh, that's that's what I think of science of space diplomacy, um, and uh, you know, there's there's real experts on this that can talk for hours yeah. on it. So, so that's that's kind of some of the headlines that we see today. Right. I mean, they're literally arriving uh, in the last 48 hours, and then in the next week, the U.S. Uh, uh, um, uh, probe will will enter Martian orbit. Um, so, Mars. It's a uh, when Mars comes near, it's really important uh, to to remember. Every 18 months or so, there's this window uh, when Mars comes near to launch these these uh, uh, interplanetary probes. Thank you. No, that was uh, <laughs> at least now I know 
what it is. So thank you. And uh, so we are very close to the end. I would like to say thank you to all the attendees. We still have 68 attendees, so they have been uh, with us. And uh, a big thank you to Amrita and Ben for joining us uh, today. And uh, we will continue these conversations in the future. Uh, as I said, this is the first event of this particular series on multi-stakeholder frameworks. Uh, we have another one in March. Uh, we, uh, all attendees will receive the information about the next uh, installment. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Amanda, Freddy, Gianluca, Corina, Daisy, Roini, Takar, and Ping for uh, helping to produce this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, also thank you to the Trend Foundation for supporting the Rethinking Diplomacy program here at Duke. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Stay well. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Amarita. Thank you, thank Duke. You to, yeah, thank you to both. And thank you to the whole uh, team for, for having us participate.